Good morning. That's better. W welcome to church. So good to see you here. My name is Rob. And uh, I'm going to start this morning.
seen the movie Amazing Grace? That's actually the building, the real building where all that stuff happened. A couple of years ago I went on a business trip and I'll make it real short. They asked me to. I had just gotten off of an 18 hour plane ride um, from Hong Kong to London and I had I was on a business trip and I ended up staying at this, they now made it into a hotel, but that was the house of a man named William Wilberforce. And I, 
don't know if you know the story, but he was a close friend of a man named John Newton. And John Newton is the man that wrote Amazing Grace. And I remember going in. I arrived there at night, the night before I took that picture. And um, there was a display case inside that, that building in the main entrance. And in that display case, well, William Wilberforce spent his entire career as a member of parliament trying to ban slavery in the British Empire. And he tried and tried and tried. And his main source of encouragement was the man John Newton. John Newton, in, before he became a believer, was a captain of a slave ship. And inside that building was a little display case, and he had a bunch of, they had a bunch of things inside that display case, including chains that were used to chain the slaves as they were on these ships. And one thing that struck me was how small they were and how restrictive they were. And I was frozen there, standing in front of that. And one thing that ran through my mind was how we have lost the word amazing. You know, last night, I don't know if you noticed the shaker that she was, I was in the Guitar Center store and I was paying for that shaker and they had amazing guitar strings. What? You go into Starbucks, an amazing cup of coffee. You know, I think we've lost the word amazing in our culture. When John Newton wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, you know, back then, amazing was a special word. You know, they put, it in a, they put it in a safe place and they only took it out on special occasions. It meant amazing. You stood there in amazement. As I stood in front of that cabinet and I was frozen, and I read, they had a page from the legislation that banned slavery in the British Empire. I was amazed at what was there. And John Newton talks about amazing grace. It was that word that was reserved for special occasions and would only be used at very special times to talk about that grace that God bestowed on him as a slave ship owner that amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. So I started, I downloaded uh, Newton's memoirs. I'd encourage you, they're only a dollar if you have an e-reader, and read through it. And then this, this version that we're going to sing made more sense to me. My chains are gone, I've been set free. It sounds like something Newton would have written. And then the verse that we sing at the end here that wasn't in the hymnal when I was growing up, that's actually one of the verses that he wrote, one of the original verses. So what I want to do is just tell you that little bit. Oh, and this is the field. This is the actual field where God took hold of William Wilberforce. That field, you, you, if you saw the movie, this is the actual field. And the reason I tell you this is so when you sing this song, you realize what was going through the mind of John Newton when he wrote it. It wasn't just, uh, you know, the amazing cup of coffee, but it's the amazing grace of God that would save somebody even like me. So if you can please rise and we'll sing this. And oh, there it is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound Saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now Grace, 
grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns on end. Once again, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Morrisville. We have a very exciting week coming up, a week
week of ministry, of um, energy, of fun, and I'm going to ask Adam Pyle if he would come up and share some details about the uh, uh, preparations for uh, tomorrow night's mega sports camp kickoff, and uh, I hope that you're as excited as, uh, as we are for this. Good morning. Uh, like Pastor Ed said, tomorrow starts Mega Sports Camp. Um, it's the fifth year, I believe, that we've we've done Mega Sports Camp, and uh, as of now, we have just about 100 kids registered online, which is the most we've ever had pre-register for Sports Camp. <laughs> which is really scary. <laughs> um, we still need some help. You know, we need some help with uh, basketball. We need some help with soccer. Um, if somebody could help with football. Uh, the problem being that because of the state laws, you have to have a uh, criminal and child abuse background check to make sure your kid's safe so you can be around everybody's kids. So if you already have that done, uh, please see us after church, and uh, we'll get you plugged in someplace. Um, we'd like everybody who's participating in Mega Sports Camp to get to the church or the field around 5 o'clock tomorrow if you can. If you can't, that's okay. But if you can, we'd appreciate the help setting up. Um, and just keep us in prayer. You know, this is a great opportunity to reach the community, to reach the children. Uh, like, I, I like to keep saying that, you know, everybody thinks because there's a church on every corner in America that people, children especially, are exposed to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. And that's just not the case. You know, most people walk right past places like this. Um, we're being marginalized and pushed to the edges. And, and the message of Jesus Christ and his amazing grace is being lost on America. Um, World Mission says that by the end of the, uh, 2020, this will be the biggest mission field in the world, the United States of America. So keep that in mind. Um, and use this as a great opportunity to get out there and meet your neighbors. Uh, Pastor Red? Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We will be praying for you and Hal and all of the leaders of uh, Mega Sports Camp because we know it requires a lot of energy, a lot of work. And uh, we are excited about it. But that's not the only thing going on. Uh, this week, uh, we'll have some campers going to uh, High Point Camp. Uh, this week and next week, uh, we had a group of high schoolers uh, go to our summer camp uh, this past week. And they're going to be sharing uh, during the offering time, I believe, uh, a little bit, a little testimony of how God impacted their lives. So there's a lot going on, a lot to be involved in, a lot to be praying for. A lot that we can support through our prayers and our giving. And so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give of our tithes and our offerings in order to support these wonderful ministries that God has blessed us with to be a part of. All right, let's pray. Father God, what a privilege and a thrill to be a part of a church uh, where you are moving in the hearts of those that attend, uh, and not only that, but in, in our hearts to reach out to those that don't yet attend or those that don't maybe not yet know you. We pray that you would be with the leadership of Mega Sports Camp, that you would be strengthening them physically and guiding them spiritually as they work with the, the children, uh, over 100 children this week. Uh, we pray that many of them would hear the gospel and respond, and it would change their lives for the rest of their lives. Uh, we also pray for those heading off to High Point. Again, we ask that you would use this week to change their lives, to draw them closer to you, and make commitments that will be life-impacting. Uh, and we thank you for all the other ministries that are taking place around us all the time, Sunday school and children's church and all those things that go on in the background that are so important for the people that are involved in that. And so, Lord, we lift up these praises and these requests before your name as we give in your name and as we pray for your glory. Amen.
then kids can come up. And while they're coming up, you know, I enjoy everybody's special music, but I enjoy Carmina's just a little bit more because if you watch her when she's playing, she feels that music. You know what I mean? I just get up here and I play and I just do my thing. But you can just see the look on her face. She closes her eyes and she just feels the whole thing. Oh, scoot over. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we had five kids go um, and myself and Jess were there. So uh, Jess is still down there. She's staying for the weekend. Um, her sister Kim is there, so they're hanging out and celebrating birthday and doing all kinds of stuff. So she'll be back today or tomorrow. Um, but so we got three of them that managed to make it to the first service. Um, so uh, the theme this week was no other name. Um, and uh, each night they had a different aspect of no other name. The first night was no other name can compare to Jesus' name. Um, no other name can satisfy was the second night. Um, no other name can heal was the third night and specifically dealt with um, things in their past that they struggled with that, you know, people have hurt them, harmed them, um, either physically, mentally, stuff like that. Um, and then the last night was no other name can save. Um, and so that was kind of the theme that ran through the week. Um, so if you guys want to tell um, everybody, share with them um, one thing that, what was your favorite thing about the week and one thing that you learned. Um, and also just wanted to thank everybody who gave scholarships um, between the Masters Inn and the High Point. There were seven kids that are going to camp because of your generosity. So. always neat for me and and Jess would echo this as well um, to watch the kids um, it's funny some some are saying oh I don't really want to come and they're trying to you know come up with excuses why not to go uh, but as soon as they get there 
you can just watch God work in their life and, and, and change them, and you can see that they're different people when they come home. So, uh, again, thanks for those who gave and those who prayed especially, and be in prayer for those going to High Point because they're getting ready to go through that same experience. So, thanks. remind people. I've read the end of the book and we win. So this is a new song and uh, it's called The Lion and the Lamb. Sounds like somebody knows that already. <laughs> okay, so you might have heard it on the radio, but uh, it refers to Jesus as the Lion of Judah and the Lamb who died to take the sins of the earth, the sins of the world. He's coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. way before the King of Kings, the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah, He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb and every bow before the lion and the lamb oh, oh, oh and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh, oh, oh and every knee will bow before the lion and the Greet somebody near you. Put your water in my bed. 
Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Hi everyone, my name is Scott and I'm Lisa and we are so glad that you found our website Marriage Rocks. We hope that the resources we provide and some of the ministry we're able to have will be an encouragement to you. Scott and I met in college and we were married on August 20th, 1988 and we have three beautiful children, Lindsay, Ashley and Josiah. We've also had the privilege of being in pastoral ministry for over 27 years. Uh, I was a youth pastor, an associate pastor, as well as a uh, lead pastor. And I think one of the strengths of our ministry has been working together as a husband and wife team in ministry. And even when our kids came into the picture, they've joined us as we've been able to serve together as a family. But one of the growing burdens on our hearts has been marriages. You know, it's easy to get married, but it's a lot harder today to stay married. And we want marriages not just to survive, but to thrive. And that's why we developed Marriage Rocks. It's interesting also, the first human relationship that God created was marriage. He created Adam and Eve. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 2. And in fact, the Bible starts and ends with a wedding. And we think that's really significant because it means that weddings and more importantly, marriages are important to God. He is for your marriage. Our mission statement is to encourage, equip, and inspire couples to a radically successful marriage. So how do we accomplish that? Well, one of the resources is our book, Marriage Rocks, and we hope that you'll be able to access that. We know you can through our website, and also read the introduction if you're interested. But also through teaching and speaking opportunities, we love to meet with groups, uh, whether it's retreats or conferences, one-day events or weekends, even men's and women's events. Uh, we love to meet new groups of people and encourage them with biblical principles that will help them have a radically successful marriage. So God bless you. He's for you and for your marriage. And so are we. So you recognize those people, huh? It's coming, it's coming. So that's, uh, yeah, what? Yeah, they couldn't Photoshop hair into the video very well. But, uh, but yeah, we're really excited. That website goes up this week. That's the introductory video. As soon as people get on, it's, if you want to write it down, it's uh, Scott and Lisa Marriage Rocks.com is our main website. Scott and Lisa Marriage Rocks.com. And uh, keep praying about the book, it's coming but uh, not quite done yet, and that'll need to be published soon. But we appreciate so much your, your prayers and your support um, and allowing us to continue to move forward with that vision. And uh, we've got some dates already on our calendar, some speaking opportunities, and uh, we're just excited to see what God's going to do. If you have your Bibles, though, would you take them today and turn to Ezra chapter 3? The pastor started a series last week uh, going through Ezra and then also the book of Nehemiah. I had to convince him, though, that three chapters was too much for me to handle in one message. I think just taking Ezra 3 is going to be a challenge in the next 30 minutes to try to go through six pages of notes as I put some study in this week. Um, but today our, our theme is rebuilding. How many of you um, at your home had to at some point go through some rebuilding? Yep, just, a, just about all of us. I remember when Lisa and I moved into our home in Fairless Hills in 1998. Uh, it was... Uh, our 10th anniversary, wedding anniversary. We slept on a mattress on the living room floor. We were so excited. You know, we had just started to get some, some things moved in. The kids were still at the church parsonage. And, um, and so we were just there that night. And we woke up the next morning, and uh, it, it started to pour rain. Um, and we got up. And in our foyer, some of you have been there, there's a brick wall. And, and, and water was, was cascading down the brick wall in our foyer. It looked like a little... Nice little waterfall. <laughs> What's that? Custom made. Yeah, that, no, it wasn't, actually. Uh, so guess what our first rebuilding project was in our new home? The roof. You know, it seems like in life um, there's always rebuilding to be done. Uh, and we're not obviously talking today about homes and properties, but we're talking about lives being rebuilt. And I'm sure many of you, if you live long enough, there's been some things in your life um, that had to be rebuilt. Why does something have to be rebuilt? Because something 
was damaged or destroyed. And uh, when you look throughout history, I mean, even some recent history, but then even going back into our country, there's many, been many rebuilding projects. Um, you think of the Civil War, you know, the North and the South, and brothers killing brothers, and uh, Abraham Lincoln as our president trying to work through the process of abolishing slavery in our land. Uh, as it's interesting, you know, talking about Amazing Grace and John Newton's story. But, um, but there was a lot of healing and a lot of rebuilding that needed to take place after that civil war. Think about um, other wars, like World War II. When you look at the landscape of Europe after World War II, I mean, there were cities that were just decimated, buildings that were destroyed, people's lives, you know, having to start from scratch. Uh, also, not just in Europe, but also in Japan after two bombs took out two, you know, major cities. Uh, the Johnstown Flood, I think about that in, 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 in our history. I think of 9-11, all the rebuilding that's had to take place. Katrina uh, down in uh, Louisiana. Haiti hit by how many earthquakes over the last several years constantly. Once they rebuilt, you know, another one would come and wipe out uh, so much of that poor, poor country. Um, so rebuilding has been a, a part of the human experience. But today we want to talk about rebuilding spiritually because the nation of Israel was going to go back to their homeland. That's what Ezra is about. And they're going to start by rebuilding a very important place. It's called the temple. And so in your introduction and in your notes, if you took them out of your bulletin, you can uh, jot down some of these thoughts. But before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. God, I just thank you again so much that even though things in our lives uh, can take a bad turn, even though sometimes through our own decisions we alienate ourselves from you and maybe sometimes from other people and God many times things have to be rebuilt in our lives I'm thankful that you are there to help us in that process and you are committed especially for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ that you're going to finish what you've started and God sometimes during our lives there's things that need to be rebuilt and I pray that today would be an encouragement for every one of us because Lord none of us none of us are a finished product not yet so God, guide us uh, through your spirit to understanding the word of God, but also to apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned, we all have areas of our lives that need rebuilding. Write that word rebuilding in your notes under the introduction. Um, and some of you perhaps uh, years ago gave into a particular sin, which, uh, which led to some huge consequences. Mistake. Sin. And some, it's been a sinful lifestyle, and it brought significant consequences in your life. Some have drifted out of what was a serious relationship with Christ, and some have altogether abandoned their relationship with Christ, which really was what was taking place with the Israelites. You know, they um, had so much of a history of God uh, working in and through them, uh, giving them the land and, and the, the taking over and, and having so much success over the years, but then they turned their back on God, they began worshiping other idols, idols of other countries, and forgetting to follow through on the commandments and the law and the, the, uh, the sacrifices and the festivals, they put all that to the side, and because of that, God's judgment came as discipline in the form of captivity in Assyria and in Babylon for the Judeans. And some of you are here today at church partially because you know that something in your life needs rebuilding. Something in your life has been torn down and you feel the need to start rebuilding. I mentioned uh, last time I spoke about a lunch I was going to have with Larry, a uh, gentleman who um, I met through a funeral and you know, who called me and said, would you do lunch with me? And uh, I sat with him and just the follow-up of the story, we had a wonderful Opportunity just to share some time together, and he opened up about so much that's fallen apart in his life, including his marriage, uh, his financial picture, um, so many things. But um, but God was getting a hold of his heart to ultimately show him what was most lacking in his life was his relationship with God through Christ. And uh, what a great opportunity we had to spend time with him, to pray with him, and try to redirect him towards some resources and back to a church in his area where he'd be able to start that rebuilding process in his life. Some things God might bring back in his life and some things might, might not. Uh, we don't know, you know whether his wife will change her mind, but we talked about his responses and his need to do his part. 
And, uh, and some of you maybe are rebuilding from significant trials, maybe the loss of a loved one, maybe a financial loss or, or, or marriage issues or relationship issues or health issues. But today we're not really talking about those type of things, rebuilding from trials, as much as we are rebuilding our relationship with Christ like Israel who had, again, gone into captivity for 70 years and now they're going home. And step one in going back to their homeland, step one wasn't going to rebuild their homes. It wasn't to rebuild their barns for their animals. It wasn't to rebuild their farms so that they could have food and sustenance. The very first thing that the Israelites were going back to the homeland to rebuild was the temple. The temple. Why? Well, look in your notes. Because the next point is that the temple represented temple represented God's presence. If you guys would just back it up to the introduction slide again, uh, that point is there. The temple represented God's presence, and that is why they were taken captive in the first place, because they disobeyed God, and they started into idolatry, and honestly, it started by skipping church, you know, skipping um, some of the aspects of their faith, the sacrifices, the festivals, which were all meant to remind them of God's goodness and kindness and provision throughout their history. And what they wanted in going back to Israel is they wanted God's presence back in their lives. And how were they going to start that? They were going to start it by rebuilding the temple. The temple represented God's presence. But also, thirdly there, you see it, it was also the center of worship and life. The temple in Jerusalem was the hub. Worshiping him was so important. And it's so easy for all of us, too, to allow worship, our time with God, to be a, a, a small little piece of the pie that represents our lives. But when we truly understand why God created us in the first place, we begin to recognize, you know what? We were created by God primarily for worship, which means the whole pie, which means every slice of your life, every slice of my life, whether it's work, family, uh, outside relationships, recreation, finance, whatever slice of the pie of your life, all of it is meant and all of it is there to be an opportunity for you to worship and give glory to God. But we all tend to think that, no, you know, the, the slice of worship is coming to church on Sunday morning at either 9, 15, or 11, right? Or maybe going to a life group. Or maybe going to a Bible study. You know, that's, that's, that's my, my, my slice. No, worship is about your whole life, not just one piece of the pie. And for the Israelites, they began to realize and, and, and needed to come back to the fact that Worship was the center, and the temple was a representation of God's presence where they could worship Him. And we know that for us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, guess who comes inside? The Holy Spirit. And we are the temple inside of us. The temple resides, the presence of God resides inside of us. We don't have to come here to worship God. Now, this is a great place to come to gather as a, a greater body of Christ, as a family of God, which we'll talk about, but... The fact is, worship isn't just isolated to inside these four walls or inside this building. Worship is to be a part of every aspect of our life. And so what I want us to talk about as we go through this passage in Ezra are key principles for rebuilding, specifically rebuilding your relationship, your walk with Christ, walk with God. And one of the things, as I read through the text from start to finish, all the verses, was this concept of unity. And so write this down in your notes. The power of unity when it comes to rebuilding is so important. Uh, when you look at verse 1, it says, Now when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered, and I, and I highlighted this in your, in, up on the screen, together as one man. It was like all these people were together as one. You know, in the army, they call it you know, the army of one, the power of one. They were united. And it says then later on in verse 9 that Jeshua with the sons and brothers, they stood united with other people who were coming for the same work to, to begin the, the, the foundation for the temple of God. It says then they, in verse 11, that they sang praising, 
They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he, the Lord, is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people, all the people, shouted with a great shout. And they praised the Lord, for the foundation of the Lord was laid. They were together as one man. They stood united, all the people. There's something powerful about people coming together in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Things can happen. Things can be rebuilt. Now, the power of unity is based on, number one, our position. Put that down in your notes. Our position. If you are here and you came to a place in your life where you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, you asked Jesus to be your Savior, you recognize that his death was for your sins, and he paid the penalty for your sins, and you said, Lord, I can't save myself. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Immediately, the Word of God says you were saved, and saved is a word that means, you know, at that moment, but also it's a progressive salvation, which means, you know, I didn't become perfect when I accepted Christ. I'm still on a journey heading towards uh, being sanctified. But at that point in time, when I placed my trust in Christ, I was placed in the body of Christ. I was placed in the family of God. I was not alone in the journey. And that's so important to know. Because you don't want to ever let yourself, when you're trying to rebuild your relationship with, with God, or rebuild aspects of your relationship with God, to f- somehow think, you know, I'm in this alone. I've got to do this myself. No, you know what? The worst thing that you can do is isolate yourself from the body of Christ. And so many people today aren't, aren't waking up today getting ready to go to church. And that's a shame. Because they think, well, I can have church at home, and I can watch, you know, and I can, you know, worship God in the woods, and, all, and you can. But there's something important about not doing the Christian life in your little isolated bubble. We grow best together. That's why our, 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 our mission statement is to grow together, together as passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Because we grow best in community. And when you isolate yourself, man, you become an easy target for the roaring lion, the devil, the adversary. You know, who does he want to pick off when he sees a, a, a pack of antelope, you know, running? The lion wants to pick off the, the one that somehow got isolated, somehow got separated from the group. So don't allow yourself in this rebuilding process to, to isolate yourself. But it's not just based on our position, but secondly, it's based on our purpose. For rebuilding to take place, we all have to have that one purpose, as we mentioned, growing together, serving together. Reaching the lost, growing the found together. When we have the same purpose, and when the Israelites had the same purpose, we're going back to the homeland. We, you know, God has opened up so graciously his loving kindness for us to go back, and we're going to start by rebuilding the temple, representing God's presence so that we could start worshiping and fellowshipping and continuing what we know God wants us to do. So if you want to rebuild your spiritual life, you, you won't be able to do it alone. I mean, can you imagine one person, you know, down at Harrison getting the Solid Rock Youth Center, that building, you know, well, Dan might have felt like he was alone sometimes, right? Because I think he probably overseed a lot of it. But a lot of other people helped him, right? Can you imagine, you know, one person saying, I'm going to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? No, it can't happen. It took a whole group of people, thousands of people, to come back and to dedicate themselves to the rebuilding of the temple. Now, not only is there the power of unity, number one, as a key principle for rebuilding, but there's also what I call the work before the work. Look at verses 2 through 5. It says, Then Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, and his brothers the priests, okay, so they were the religious leaders, and Zerubbabel, who was more the civil leader, the son of Shetel, And his brothers arose and built. Here's the first thing they built when they went back. The altar of God. Now this wasn't even perhaps the part of the temple itself. We want to get the altar set first, which is just outside the temple. Because they wanted to start burning the offerings. And by the way, this would be the first time in 50 years that offerings, burnt offerings and sacrifices would happen there in Jerusalem since they were taken captive. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God, and verse 3 says, so they set up the altar 
on its foundation. And they were terrified, note this, terrified because of all the peoples of the land. Let's talk about that for a second. One of the things that motivated them to start with an altar was they were afraid. You see, other people had been already deported to Palestine, the area of, of Jerusalem. And uh, that became their home. And now all of a sudden, these thousands of Israelites are coming back and camping, you know, in, in this area. And now these people are looking at these Israelites, you know, they're, 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 they're coming to our land, to our home, right? Where we live. They are now a threat to us. And the people of Israel were afraid that they were going to have to deal with some resistance. And guess what? They did have to deal with some resistance. In fact, it says in one, one part of the story that they had to work with a, a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other just to make sure that they were protected. And so fear was part of the motivation of getting this altar so that they could worship God. They, they knew, if we got to God, if you're not on our side, we are in serious danger. If you're not here to be our protector, we are in serious danger. So it goes on to say, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. Now kind of notice how it, it gets more significant. It starts with morning and evening. Then they fe celebrated the Feast of Booths which is also called the Feast of Tabernacles. We're not going to get into all the details of that, but that was an important uh, holy time. And as it was written, it was offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily. So on top of the morning and evening, there were other fixed offerings daily um, according to the ordinance as each day required. And afterwards, there were, get this, continual burnt offerings. So these offerings and sacrifices grew in intensity to become continual, which again leads me to share with you, you know, how, how, how and when can we worship God? How often? The answer is anytime, all the time, as we recognize God's presence in our lives. We, just a simple prayer, you know, while you're driving or while you're at school or, or while you're at work, you know, there's opportunities to, to worship God. You, you can have an altar anywhere in your life and bring worship to God. And for the Israelites, it got to a point where there were continual burnt offerings every, every minute of every hour of every day during this time period. There were offerings happening. And so what I want you to note is that rebuilding starts with worship and obedience. If, if some things in your life, especially your relationship with Christ, has been not what it should be. The rebuilding starts with worship and obedience. A lot of people think, well, I, I, can't, I can't worship God until I get my act together. You know, I, I, can't, I can't serve Him until, you know, I've got everything lined up correctly. And you know when that's going to happen? You know when you're going to have it all together? Yeah, right. Heaven is, is the right answer. And if that were true, then none of us would be here to worship because none of us are perfect. If that were true, none of us would be serving in mega sports camp this week because, well, you know, I don't have everything together. I, I, you know, I'm still, still struggling. Well, then no one would be serving because we're all in the rebuilding process. Amen? We're all trying to work towards a, a stronger, more intimate relationship with Christ. So before you have it all together, you start worshiping now. You know, start seeking Him. Start obeying the little commands now. Start putting your plans and dreams and hopes on the altar now and start pursuing God's dream for you. Speaking of altar, uh, third point in your notes is that in order for you to rebuild, sacrifice is required. There is sacrifice. There is some things that need to change in your life. Verses 5b through 7 says, And everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord, and you notice I put that again in bold, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. And the foundation of the temple, the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid because they didn't have all the resources they needed. So verse 7 says, then they gave money, they gave more money to the masons and carpenters. And they also gave them food, drink, and essential oils to the Sidonians. Oh, i sorry, I didn't know. Well, these oils probably were essential oils, by the way. To the Tyrenians, my wife can say an amen. That brings cedar wood from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the permission that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. 
So what had to happen here for them to move forward in the building process to get this foundation laid for the temple? They had to sacrifice some things. Do you realize that the rebuilding of the temple was going to take 21 years? 21 years to build. The foundation, about two and a half. And so these people were, were coming uh, you know, from this other land back to the holy land. And in some cases, it was, you know, husbands and fathers leaving families to come and, and, and to work to dedicate themselves. So they had to dedicate or sacrifice time. Uh, it says that they gave free will offerings. This is over and above what would have been normally expected. You know, that's money. And they also had to sacrifice, to some extent, relationships. A long time away from their families. I think of, um, you know, missionaries who, who go and serve. When you send your kids away to college, if they go to away, you know, you, you feel that longing. But, you know, you're, you sacrifice that because you know that they're following God's purpose for their lives. This wasn't a seven-day missions trip, you know, to Haiti or to the DR to go rebuild this temple. I mean, this was a 21-year missions trip. And many, it says, gave free-willed offerings, not required. Some gave food, probably grain, vegetables, fruits, nuts, figs, to these people that were going to provide some of the materials that were needed. So the point is, if you want to rebuild your faith, if you want to rebuild your relationship with Christ, something's got to give. Because the things that have separated you, the things that have moved you away from God's heart, you've got to sacrifice those things on, on the altar. Sometimes, it's, unfortunately, it's a relationship that isn't a good relationship. Sometimes it's an addiction that you have to put on the altar. Sometimes it's your pride or your selfishness or an unforgiving spirit that you've had. Or you have to sacrifice your doubt or your recreation, or your desire to be pain-free. In Hebrews 12, it, it talks about how we have to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. You know, it's like trying to hike a mountain with a backpack full of rocks. You know, you are never going to grow in your faith. You are never going to see God rebuild you into what you need to be for Him. If you're carrying around a bag of rocks, whatever that may be in your life, you've got to unpack those things, get them out, put them on the altar. Many of you know our son Josiah will be uh, heading into the Navy in a bit, and uh, many people have shared who have gone through you know, boot camp and training um, that you know, they are going to break you down. Is that not true, soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines? Um, they will break you down. They will strip everything away from you. And why do they do that? Yeah. So that ultimately they can rebuild you up into what you really need to be in order to be effective, in order to be disciplined, in order to be productive. And uh, some of you maybe are there now where God has been stripping down things in your life making you face some music in your life, some of the consequences of decisions you've, you've made in your life. And now it's time to start rebuilding with God's help. But until he stripped you down and got you to the bottom, you, you would not be able to stand back up on your own strength. The fourth thing that is required for rebuilding it's found in verses 8 and 9. Let me read the text and then we'll, we'll share that principle. But it says, Now in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, and the rest of the brothers, the priests, the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work and appointed the Levites. Note that the Levites who were, again, part of a very special group of people that were religious leaders. From 20 years, so some of these young people were young, and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Cadmiel and his sons, and the sons of Judah and the sons of Henadad with their sons, the brothers of the Levites, to oversee the work in the temple 
of God. And so for rebuilding to take place, there needed to be leadership. And leaders who were called out to lead needed to lead. Can I just ask you, how many of you have spiritual leaders in your life? Can I see a hand? How many of you have spiritual leaders in your life? Uh, maybe half of you. Some of you aren't sure. Or some of you maybe don't feel like you've got somebody right now in your life that you look up to that is a, a mentor to you, a spiritual leader to you. Well, I want to just share with you that if you have a spiritual leader, you need to follow them. God put them there. And if you said that you don't have anyone that you look up to as a spiritual leader, then you're in trouble because there's no way you're going to rebuild without leadership in your life. And my guess is either pride or maybe because someone's let you down or whatever, it's brought you to a place where you may say in your mind, your heart, I'm not being led by anyone. I've been, I've been hurt before. But I'm not telling you that you should blindly follow infallible men. That is not my point. Paul said, follow me as what? As I follow Christ. And I would say the same thing for me. I know Pastor Gary would say the same thing. Pat, you know, all of us in spiritual leadership would say, you know, don't follow us if we're not following Christ. But as we follow Christ, God has put people in, in leadership roles. But, and it's not just pastors that may be the spiritual leader in your life. Sometimes it's parents. Sometimes it's other relatives. Sometimes it's friends. Sometimes it is people that you may read or see on TV that can be a help to you, an inspiration to you. But the fact is, spiritual leaders need to lead. And it's important, ultimately, for each of us to get to a place where we can be a spiritual leader for someone else. It's not just about me having somebody mentor me, but the purpose is that I'm being mentored so that I can help mentor others. So there's always somebody that I should have that's ahead of me on the journey, somebody that I look up to that I can continue to learn from. But then there's people probably younger in their faith than me that I can help in some way. And as I help them grow, it helps me actually grow and reaffirm all the truths and values in my life. So who are you mentoring? Who are you helping to lead in their rebuilding process? And number five, the ultimate goal of this whole rebuilding is God's glory. Verses 10 through 15. And uh, what's really interesting in verse 10 is they didn't need a building. They didn't need a building to bring God glory. Look at verse 10. It says, Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple. That, the temple's not even completed yet. When they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with their trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals. They had their praise band there to praise and worship according to the directions of King David of Israel, who years ago when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, there was the same type of worship and dedication service. Can, can you imagine this, though? Can you imagine you have a piece of land and you're going to build a house and, and the construction team comes and they lay the foundation and everyone in your family comes and has a big celebration, a big party because the foundation's laid. No, 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 no. You know, that's not how it works. Foundation's nothing until you get the building, Right? But they were, they were celebrating, not, not that the building was up, because it wasn't. They were celebrating that there was a foundation ready to go. Seems a little premature, doesn't it? I mean, can you imagine, uh, you know, some of our construction guys, you know, the people showing up. Uh, oh, you got the foundation laid on. Huh? Let me write you a check right now for the whole thing. No, 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 no. You'd never have that happen. No. It wasn't done. The temple wasn't done, but they were already praising and worshiping God. Giving Him glory for getting them that far. And the fact is, folks, every single one of us, the foundation of our faith is that Jesus Christ died on a cross. 
and that his spirit drew us to a place where we understood it, and we asked him to be our savior. We were saved. Our salvation is the foundation of our rebuilding project, our lives. And some of you maybe have some walls and things that are being built right now. Some of you may only have the foundation, but the fact is we're, we're, none of us are finished products. But thank God he has promised he's going to finish what he starts in each one of us, and we're going to become like Christ. But the fact is we need to celebrate and give thanks for the foundation of what God has accomplished in us through Christ. And that's what we do every Sunday morning and can do every morning of our lives and every day of our lives. It reminds me of the, the graduations for the preschool kids. You know what I mean? I mean, back in my day, we, we don't know if we even had preschool. That's how old I must be. You know, it was kindergarten. And when we finished kindergarten, it wasn't like they threw a big party and I had to dress up with a cap and gown and all the parents and grandparents came. Oh, my little Scotty. Look at him walking trying to get his little fake diploma. You know, today it's like we got, we've got to have graduations for everything, right? We should have graduation parties when your kids get out of diapers, right? Oh, come on, let's have a big celebration. Yay. Well, we did probably celebrate that, actually. Actually, yeah, praise God. No more diapers. And then the next one comes. Oh, no, more diapers. <laughs> but, I mean, think about it, you know. And I'm not trying to poke fun, but, I mean, the preschools and, you know, the daycares and the things, that they'll have a little graduation ceremony and all the parents and grandparents will show up. It's so exciting. But you know what? It is exciting, isn't it? To see growth in your kids. It, it's a foundation. It's a foundation. It's just the start of hopefully what God is going to do in and through our kids, our grandkids. And so they celebrated, even though it was just a foundation. Secondly, look at verse 11. It says, They sang praising, giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness. And that word loving kindness is the Hebrew word hesed. It means God's loyal, covenantal love, which means His love that's never going to change for His people is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted, all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They all participated using what they had. Some of them were singing, some of them were shouting, some of them were playing instruments, but they all participated in that celebration. And then look at verse 12. It says, And many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the fathers of households, the old men who had seen the first temple, that's Solomon's temple, they wept with a loud voice. And when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while well, there were many who shouted aloud for joy. Can you get a sense of how incredibly emotional this day was? Again, we're just talking about the foundation for the temple being laid. But the young people are thinking, oh man, this is really cool. You know, they probably had some food and stuff on the side, you know. And the old people, the old people who were there 70 years before, when they saw their temple being destroyed, they cried. And they were probably thinking to the young people, you, you, you have no idea, no idea, you know, as they're wiping the tears from their eyes, no idea how much this means. It's just the foundation. But they remembered the glory of Solomon's temple. And it was an emotional day. Have you ever gone back to your old hometown where you grew up? Did you ever go back to your old house that you grew up in? Yeah, for me it was uh, 485 Cutler Avenue in Maple Shade. And I remember, um, it's a mixture of emotions when you go back to your old house that you grew up in. For some of us, you know, we're nostalgic. And I remember... You know, probably 15 years after, you know, we'd been way out of that house. I'd gone back, and, uh, you know, it, 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 the house looked pretty much the same. But I, I learned, as I looked around, there was a built-in swimming pool in the backyard. And I was like, <laughs> why, why couldn't we have that when I lived there? Right? Then we went back about five years later, and the house had been sold. And all of a sudden big maple tree that was in the front yard, gone. I'm like, oh, man. What's happening? 
happened to that tree? That, I used to climb that tree. It's a beautiful tree. Why did they do that? Then I went back about five years later. House sold again. Man. It was a mess. It was falling apart. And there was weeds and nothing was kept up. And it like breaks your heart. Can you imagine these old people, old men and old ladies, you know, that remember Solomon's temple going back and just, this was huge. And they had to wipe those tears from their eyes. And look at verse 13 as we close. It says, uh, so all the people, they couldn't distinguish between the sound of the shouts of joy and the sounds of weeping. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. And all I'm going to share about this is that shout represented that God had started to rebuild something. Very important. And when God starts to rebuild something in your life, when you're able to say, God, you are faithful, you are loving, you are kind, and you still want a relationship with me, and the Israelites are saying we're building the temple that represents the presence of God. He still wants us to be his people. Even though we, we messed it up, we, we disobeyed, we walked away from God, and some of you can say you did the same. But the fact that God still loves me, that he is a forgiving God, that he still wants a relationship with me of love, he still wants me to worship him, he still wants me to serve him with whatever I have. He wants to rebuild my spiritual life with him. The sound was heard far away, and I would say to you that others need to hear, others need to see, others need to know what God is doing in your life. Because they need their lives rebuilt too. Let me close in prayer as the worship team comes. Father, just thank you for um, this historical account in Ezra of bringing slaves out of captivity and allowing them to rebuild something very important. And Father, all of us are in the rebuilding stage at some point in our lives. And none of us are a filled uh, uh, finished product. So God, I pray that you'd help us to apply these principles to our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Never gives up, it never runs.
comes out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the